delighted to be joined by Hans Kudenani, Senior Research Fellow at Chatham House and Associate Fellow at the Institute for German Studies at Birmingham University. You're very, very welcome to the Institute today. Thank you for having me. Hans, I'm wondering if could I start with, well, the global shift in power has substantially altered in recent years. What do you think the European Union can do to be a more effective global actor? And then what can Germany's role be in this? Well, to be honest, I think that Europe has got, I mean, if we're talking about the EU, um, has enough of its own sort of internal problems, frankly. And I think that it's going to be quite difficult for the EU to play a global role until it fixes its internal problems. Um, I mean, this is basically the whole set of problems that go back to the Euro crisis, the fault lines between the north and the south of Europe, the west and the east of Europe that came out particularly in the refugee crisis. Um, and I think that those internal, um, those internal kind of fault lines really prevent Europe from being able to play a bigger global role. Um, so I'm rather sceptical that, um, that Europe is going to be able to play some big role as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an actor. And in relation to Germany, do you think it can be to play more? Well, I mean, Germany, I think, is in many ways is a big part of the problem. Um, I think it's holding back um, Europe from playing that kind of role. The most obvious way in which it does that is the way that it doesn't spend enough on security, um, you know, which makes it quite difficult just for the Europeans to... Um, you know, defend themselves without, for example, American support, let alone playing some kind of role, for example, you know, beyond Europe in Asian security, for example. Um, it's, it's pretty unthinkable that, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult to imagine how Europe can do that unless Germany starts to play a much more active role in European security. Okay, and, and German Chancellor Angela Merkel has played a major role, a leading role in EU politics for well over a decade. But Angret um, Kramp Karen Bauer was widely seen as her chosen successor, and she's recently announced that she will not stand for the position of Chancellor. So how has this affected internal uh, politics in Germany? Um, well, I mean, it means that there'll be sort of protracted leadership struggle, um, uh, you know, in terms of um, who's going to become the next leader of the Christian Democrats, um, and, and that then will have a knock-on effect for who the next Chancellor will be. Um, so it means that Germany will be preoccupied with that for the next, you know, um, months, perhaps year, year or two even. Um, but actually, I think that, that it doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of German policy, um, partly because, you know, in a way, regardless of who the German Chancellor is, the way that German politics functions is that you have to have such a sort of, I mean, there's such a consensus in German politics in the first place around all of the big issues, whether it's economic issues or security issues. Um, and so I don't think who, you know, I don't think the, the new chancellor is going to make a huge difference one way or the other. But in any case, structurally, because of the way that German politics works with the federal system um, and, you know, often the need for, you know, coalition building, um, actually, you know, it's, you have to sort of reach this kind of consensus with other parties um, anyway. So I don't think, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't think there's going to be a big change in German policy, almost regardless of who the next leader of the Christian Democrats or the next Chancellor is going to be. Okay. And you've described Germany as a semi-hegemon in the EU. What do you actually mean by this? And how do you think this position might be changing as well? So that's really interesting. Um, basically, I was, I, I've been arguing for the last, you know, um, five years or so against the idea that Germany is a hegemon in Lots of people have claimed that it's a hegemon or a reluctant hegemon, which kind of suggests that it's not yet a hegemon, but it could be if it overcame this kind of mental block that it has about leading Europe. I think that's wrong. I don't think Germany has the resources to be a European hegemon. In fact, I think that's one of the lessons of European history, is that Germany's not big enough to be a European hegemon. And one illustration of that, one very, very simple illustration of that, is if you look at the size of the German economy um, as, a, as a share of the Eurozone economy, so forget Britain, forget you know, the other EU member states that aren't members of the Eurozone. If you just look at the Eurozone, German GDP is 28% of the Eurozone's GDP. That's quite big, but it's not that big. Um, if you put Italy and uh, France together, that's a bigger share of Eurozone GDP than Germany's, which illustrates that Germany uh, is not really in a position to be a hegemon. Um, so I think Germany's in this kind of in-between position that it was historically as well. 
of being a semi-hegemon. It's not quite big and powerful enough to be a hegemon, but it's also somehow too big for the sort of balance that existed in, in Europe um, uh, previously. Um, and so there's a, that, I think, creates a certain kind of instability. Um, having said all that, it's clearly not like the classical German question, which was all about military power. This is basically about economic power. Um, so I'm not suggesting that you know, there's any kind of danger of war in Europe. Um, what I think is now changing is that um, with the uncertainty about the US security guarantee to Europe, um, suddenly I think now the balance between France and Germany has shifted a bit. Basically, France has become more powerful relative to Germany. Germany has become a bit weaker relative to France than it was before, um, which I think actually could be a good thing because I think the part of what went wrong in the EU in the last decade or so is that the balance between France and Germany um, uh, you know, was basically off. Um, and so in a funny way, um, I think the uncertainty about the US security guarantee could be a good thing for Europe. It could help restore the balance um, within Europe. And ultimately, it could help, I think, resolve some of the economic questions around the Eurozone that France and Germany and the rest of the Eurozone have been fighting about for a decade now. And, and speaking of that Franco-German relationship, it's always seen, as, it's always been described as the driving force behind the European project. How do you really see that unfolding in the future in the coming years of how that relationship will work out? I mean, I think that the first thing to say is that historically it was the driving force. But I think that with the widening of the European Union in the 2000s, that ceased to work in the way that it did before. Um, it wasn't enough anymore for France and Germany to agree on something to get wider agreement in the EU. Um, there's a whole new set of fault lines now, particularly between West and East. And you see that on many issues, France and Germany are actually on the same side of the argument, other EU member states are on the other side. So I don't think the Franco-German relationship in any case works in the way that it used to. Um, this kind of um, basis for a wider European agreement. But in any case, um, my hope, as I say, is that the new uncertainty about the US security guarantee um, gives France a little bit more leverage than it's had over the last, um, over the last decade. Um, and that, that could lead ultimately to a kind of a new kind of deal between France and Germany that would be good for the rest of Europe. And, and finally, turning to the European Commission, the Commission has made climate change and climate action one of its key or top priorities. Where does Germany stand on the European Green Deal? Um, well, um, it's a very interesting question. Germany um, talks a good game on the environment. Um, I mean, it's, it's you know, um, rhetorically very committed to preventing climate change. I mean, on the surface, it looks like one of the greenest countries in the world, Germany. Um, but actually, if you scratch the surface a little bit, um, actually Germany's record is not that great. Um, you know, and, and again, to come back to the Franco-German relationship, you know, another good example of this is the way that you know, Germany bans nuclear power, but sort of continues to rely on French nuclear power. You know, one of the other consequences of banning nuclear power was that it's had to increase its dependence on fossil fuels. So actually, you know, the reality is a little bit different from the rhetoric in, in Germany on the Green New Deal. Um, but also the really interesting aspect of that is that, is that you know, Germans are so opposed to basically Keynesian kind of deficit spending that actually a real Green New Deal is quite difficult to do in Germany. Not because of the lack of commitment to environmentalism, but because of opposition, as I say, to investment, basically. Um, so I think it's quite interesting when I compare the debate about the Green New Deal in America with the Green New Deal debate in Germany, you know, in America, the bit that lots of Americans have a problem with is the green part. Um, in Germany, nobody really has a problem with that, um, but they have a problem with the New Deal part, i.e. the idea of actually investing in, 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 um, in, in, a, in a big way. So, as I understand it, what's happened is that um, you know, the, the, the Green New Deal that the European Commission is now, um, is now putting forward has been basically hollowed out, um, involves very small sums of money, um, and that's partly to do with German resistance to the idea of um, you know, spending a lot on, um, on investment. Okay, thank you very much for joining us here today, Hans Kandanani. Thank, thank you. you.